It had been mentioned in the comments that some of you might want to see the tweaks that I've done to my Matter Hacker's Pulse. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to walk through what I'm calling the Pulse CR. I purchased my Matter Hacker's Pulse back in June 2018. Back then, they were still using the older i3 style design where you have the threaded rods for the Y frame. They have since upgraded that to the newer aluminum extrusion model. But since the Prusa i3 design is probably the most popular 3D printer design of all time, and it's open source, it's really easy to tweak and to add features to it as you see fit. When Matter Hackers designed the Pulse, they did a couple things on it that I really didn't care for. And you can see that in the Pulse review up here. But I wanted to change it up a bit and make it perform more like I think an i3 style printer like this should. And I didn't want to go changing everything about the Pulse. I wanted to keep a lot of it stock, but add some features to it that even the Prusa Mark II didn't have. All while keeping with the main branch of Marlin firmware. And the first thing I wanted to tackle about the Pulse was the extruder setup. So my Pulse is the base model. It was the most affordable one that you could get. There are different ones and you can mix and match a lot of features, but when I received mine originally, it had this really chunky extruder motor with this EZR extruder sitting right about here and it would feed the hot end with a Bowden tube. Now there's absolutely nothing wrong with the EZR extruder. I just don't care for using Bowden on an i3 style machine. I don't think it's really necessary, so I definitely wanted to change that. The first thing I did was remove this whole assembly. And then that takes us to the hot end carriage, where I've converted it over to a direct drive. And you've probably seen this design before, because I took the parts directly from the Prusa Mark II library. It's exactly the same setup. All the parts fit directly on the pulse, even the carriage that mounts up to the smooth rods. Everything fit perfectly. I used a little smaller extruder motor to save some weight, I didn't think you needed one nearly that big like they use on the Prusa design. I did change over to a genuine V6 hot end rather than the V6 light because the V6 light has a PTFE liner in it. I'm also using a genuine Penda 1 Pro for bed leveling. The original Matter Hackers design used a BL Touch for leveling. I also added this filament runout sensor that I designed on top, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another thing I changed was this part over here. From the factory, the Pulse homes up here in the top left. They use this inductive sensor in this part. I didn't even change this part up, I just removed it, and now I home down at 000 on the bed, like a normal Prusa printer would. One thing you'll notice that I didn't change was all the sound dampening that they use on the Pulse. That makes it really quiet. That was a nice feature add, there was no need to change that up at all. Now stock, the Pulse is using the Mark 42 heated bed, but they have a build tack sheet on top. So I removed that sheet and just put a sheet of PEI on it, but they do still have intact the leveling points for your 9 point leveling, just like a Prusa Mark II would. So we can utilize that inductive probe the same way that a Prusa machine will. So that got rid of the BL Touch, I could use the inductive sensor that the Prusa normally has, and I could level just the same after a few Marlin tweaks. Again, I left the Z motor dampeners in place. I did that for the Y as well. Again, that's just a nice add-on feature, and this machine is definitely more quiet than a Prusa Mark II ever was. And then we have probably my favorite feature add, and that was the LCD screen. By default, on the most affordable option for the Pulse, you don't get an LCD screen. Matter Hackers did send me a riprap discount screen for free, but I definitely wanted to upgrade that into something a little snazzier. So I picked up this black and white screen from Printed Solid, and I think it looks really good with the black plastic and the blue frame. Now the Y carriage on the Pulse triggers the end stop a little differently than a Prusa machine would. The switch actually sits on the gantry right here, which isn't a big issue, but you have this arm on the front of the Y frame that triggers that end stop. So it's going to clip a normal LCD bracket. So open source to the rescue, I just altered the LCD holder brackets. They're about twice as long as a normal Prusa would be. That way that arm that triggers the Y end stop when it comes all the way forward won't get hung up on the top of the LCD screen and everything works just fine. I will leave a link to these brackets in the description below if you have a use for them. Another part that I might consider upgrading in the future is this Y belt tensioner right here. I think there's a few things you could do to make this a little bit better, but it's working just fine for now. 
Another feature on the Pulse that comes stock that I didn't want to change up are these rubber feet. Again, it makes the machine a lot quieter. And here's a look at the main board configuration. You're not going to be able to tell very well because I don't have a before and after shot. But since we had an inductive sensor and a BL touch, the wiring was just a little bit more complicated than it needed to be. Now that we just have the regular inductive probe doing the leveling and we're not homing at the top left, we can just use the regular configuration where we have the X, Y, and Z end stops where the Z is the probe. You will notice one set of extra wires up here in the Z max slot and that's for our filament runout sensor. Ultimately, my runout sensor design is just a regular optical end stop. One thing that I haven't changed up about the Pulse that I might consider doing in the future is the power brick that it uses. But it's not because there's a problem with the power brick, it powers the printer just fine. But if I were to go with a more conventional power supply design, I could mount it a bit differently and add some rigidity to the Pulse's frame. Now on a Prusa Mark II design, you would have a power supply back here that bolted to the frame, and then there'd be a foot that hooked to the corner of the frame here that made it a lot more rigid. The Pulse was designed to feed a Bowden style extruder right above this spool holder that they added, but since I have a direct drive now, there's really no use for this holder, and I think adding that supply would be a big advantage for this design. So we might go that route eventually, or just design a bracket where we could slide the stock power brick in while still bolting it to the frame. So that's all the physical changes that I've made to the Pulse. Ultimately, we're just making it a lot more like a Prusa Mark II, but we get a lot of nice spare parts that we can use on other builds. Now there's one feature the Prusa Mark II never had that I always wish it did, and that was a filament runout sensor. When the Prusa Mark III S came out and they were using the steel ball design on their sensor, I took that as inspiration to make a sensor that would fit on the Mark II extruder design, and that's probably the feature that I'm most proud of. And here's the design I came up with. This housing sets on top of the Prusa Mark II extruder design. This piece clamps on to the lever that you use to load filament in the idler. You have an 8mm by 3mm magnet back here. The filament path runs on top. And you have a cup where you have a steel ball that has a flag to trigger the sensor. So this steel ball will get stuck with that magnet that's on the back of the housing like this and that flag will trigger an optical instop when the filament runs out. So you screw your instop down in the back, and then when the filament is present, the instop is not triggered. When it's absent, it is triggered. This design actually worked a lot better than I thought it would. That round ball allows it to eject the filament on the unload, so you can add new filament after the sensor's been triggered. So the housing sets on the lever just like this, and then you can tighten it down with this screw. It has a captive nut in the back, and then we have our wire hooked up to one of our maximum end stops. I think I said it was hooked up to the Z max before. It's actually hooked up to the X max, but you can use any one of those as long as it's configured correctly in the firmware. But then you can just load the filament manually. You can actually just use this whole housing to open up the extruder arm a bit. It goes right in, no issue, because it's going across that round ball. So we're printing, filament gets cut, sensor gets triggered, M600 gets ran, we move to the front. It's able to kick the filament out without getting stuck because of that ball. Pull out the filament. We can insert new filament. We hit the button. We heat back up. We purge some filament just like normal. Purge looks good, we'll continue. Right back to printing. So that's all for the hardware, but I did do some pretty excessive firmware tweaking to get all the features and the performance that I wanted out of this printer. I am using Marlin 1.1.9, and you could use the original Prusa firmware and eventually get it to work, but you're going to lose a lot of the features that Marlin has nowadays, including Linear Advance 1.5, and that's going to be a feature you definitely want to have. I will leave a link to this configuration in the description below. But with all the hardware and firmware tweaks, how does it print? Well, let's take a look. This is a Benchy that I completed on the Pulse after I had my configuration complete. It's 200% scale, 10% infill, a 0.2 layer height. Remember, the Pulse is still using the Ulta Machine Mini Rambo board, and with the drivers that are included on that board, you have a little bit of noise that you can see in the model. You can kind of see it down in here, especially at speed. 
The top speed on this one was just a little bit over 100 millimeters a second with linear advance 1.5 enabled. And you can knock out a 200% Vinci, 10% infill in less than five hours. And if you go into your slicer and compare that print time with a lot of the other i3 Cartesian style machines, it's pretty impressive actually being able to do that under five hours and get any kind of quality. Of course, you could continue to tune and get that print time down, but I'm really happy with these results for an everyday printer. So that's the current status of the Pulse CR. Now I might do a few more tweaks down the road to make it a little easier to use, maybe a little bit more consistent, but I use about six or seven different 3D printers on a regular basis, and this is one of them. It sits right next to all my other Prusa machines, and it holds its own no problem at all. Now we could get crazy with this. We could convert it into a Bear, or take it to a 2.5, or all the way to a Mark III. But right now, as it sets, it gets good, consistent prints in a reasonable amount of time, and the machine configuration right now is fairly reliable. So at this point, I think I'll just leave it alone. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up, or subscribing to my channel. If not, leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.